Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome back to another episode of the Sweet Nothings podcast. If you're new here or if you're returning, this is your home of relaxed, funny, and informative chats all about the love of eating. We'll talk about the latest food trends, controversial opinions, and all things edible. If you're new here, my name is Kelly. It's lovely to have you. I am someone who eats, talks about, and thinks about food far too much, but enjoys every single second of it. Now, I will apologise. I am recording in a different location this month, so the sound might not be identical if you're kind of binge listening at the moment, but um, I'll hope to fix that soon. I'm not a professional. Forgive me. (laughs) So you have probably guessed by today's title, and especially if you listened to last month's episode, today I want to kind of carry on where we left off in the last episode. That's not to say that I will continue waffling about exactly the same subject, but last month we dove into what it's really like to live with an eating disorder, disordered eating of any and all forms, and not just any kind of, you know, NHS symptoms, diagnosis page kind of way, but in a proper real life, raw example of what that is like for the sufferer and the people who have to suffer around the sufferer. (laughs) But before we get into that, and I share more of my experience as a teenager and an adult following on from the discussion of childhood last month, let's get into this month's food trends and some big food news here in the UK for chocolate lovers like me. I would be remiss not to mention the food trend of the entirety of September and half of October at this point, (laughs) which is the new queen of food TikTok and an absolute viral name and cook online at the moment, and that is Emily Mariko and her salmon rice bowl. Now, If you are not on TikTok, you may have seen this, you may have seen it kind of also reproduced on YouTube Shorts or Instagram Reels or Twitter, whatever you like to consume your media. But Emily Mariko is a lovely young woman who I found on TikTok through this viral video, as many of us did, but since then have been absolutely drinking up her content. I don't think she's a cook as such. I think she's just someone who loves to cook at home and loves to eat food, which is wonderful to see. Um, And the reason she's gone so viral is not only the dish she makes, but the kind of how comforting it looks and the method with which she makes it. I'll try my best to give a good kind of Nigella Lawson-like description for those who aren't (laughs) video viewers on YouTube at the moment. If you're just listening, let me try and paint the picture for you. Essentially, she takes a kind of a nice selection of very high quality leftovers out of her fridge, being what looks like either leftover sushi rice or sticky rice, alongside some leftover salmon fillets and a few other ingredients, as well as an avocado, some mayonnaise and what looks like sriracha or a different kind of hot sauce. And she flakes the salmon, bungs it on a plate, takes the rice and does the same. Then she puts an ice cube right in the centre of the rice. And this is where I think people have been both hooked and confused. (laughs) She then places a sheet of, I think it's normally like parchment paper or grease proof paper over the top, microwaves it to heat it up and the ice comes out with it. This ice does not disappear, folks. It does not melt. I thought the ice was for the purpose of moisture and steam, but... Apparently not. The ice cube survives the microwaving somehow (laughs) through some sorcery. And she then takes it out and kind of mashes all of the salmon and the rice together so that it's kind of one homogenous, lovely looking mash. Adds a few seasonings, drizzles over sriracha and what looks like QP mayonnaise, and then adds a bit of avocado and just looks like she's having the best time in the world eating it. And people have been recreating this, people have been commenting and sharing on this. The video has tens of millions of views now. And since then, her lovely kind of relaxing, wholesome cooking and eating content has gone similarly viral, which is great to see. There's no kind of extreme, you know, normally food trends are 
things that are supposed to make your life easier but just end up being a worse way to eat or cook. <laughs> or they end up, you know, being just extremes, you know, tiny food or enormous food, the most calorific food you could think of or the most kind of, you know, California vegan kind of food you could think of. This is just proper, proper cooking and a proper good use of leftovers and just seeing a young woman enjoy food so much. It's, it's great. It's a really wholesome trend. It's one of the best things that I think has gone viral in terms of food this year. And it's been really nice to watch. The only other kind of food trend that TikTok has <laughs> bestowed upon us this month, I was going to say gifted, but it is truly not a gift, <laughs> is another viral video, which was, I believe her name was, well, I mean, the video highlighted here is from Lil Sipper Official. She could have a different name on TikTok, but another young woman who... <sighs> For her own reasons, it may be due to intolerance, it may just be due to a bad day, <laughs> advocated using the kind of layers of a raw onion as tortilla chips to dunk into salsa instead of chips. And it's the very definition of disturbing. <laughs> instead of using a nice, lovely, crunchy Dorito or any other tortilla chip, any other crisp, even any other raw vegetable, such as, you know, a nice, you know, juicy stick of celery, or a nice crunchy bit of cucumber, any other nice, relatively gently flavoured vegetable, she decides for some reason to torture herself, her taste buds, and anyone who comes across her breath by using the kind of a flake of a layer of raw onion to dip and snack on with salsa and it's upsetting so here you are there's the information do what you will with it you can go and find the video i think i shared the video on my tiktok account but yeah it's it's a trend that i can't even entertain the thought of trying <laughs> so i'll move on trends aside the big kind of nugget of food news that has been very welcome in the uk this month compared to all of the other food news, which just tends to be that, you know, we have a shortage of everything due to Brexit or just shortages in general, whether that be fuel to get you anywhere or when you do get somewhere, you find that your supermarket shelves or the restaurants or bars are out of ingredients. How long this will last for, I don't know. But aside from shortages, <laughs> some news that was quite welcomed by both chocolate lovers and anyone plant-based or dairy intolerant is that Cadbury, after literally over a hundred years, have created their first ever plant-based milk chocolate bar to try and stand up to their huge range of milk chocolate. How this will go, I'm not sure, but there's been a lot of hype around it. So there are going to be two flavors released in the kind of initial run and they're calling it the Cadbury Plant Bar. Which I hate. <laughs> but, you know, it could be worse. One is just a kind of plain, smooth, plant-based chocolate bar. And the other one has salted caramel. Which I'm guessing will just be chunks of, you know, solid sugar that will upset your dentist. In terms of what I'm expecting, I'm keeping things from getting too hyped up and hopeful for the moment. I must say Mars range of vegan products that they've released in terms of the galaxy, the topic and the bounty that I've tasted from their vegan range, their plant-based range, have been far more impressive than I expected. I expected subpar, chalky, or perhaps just poor quality tasting chocolate. But for what they've created, while it obviously isn't the best chocolate experience of your life, as a plant-based bar that is flavoured with hazelnut or coconut, whatever flavour they've done, they've done it pretty well, especially for the standard of a mass producer of cheap chocolate. I hope Cadbury can do something similar. They've had a lot of products that personally I haven't loved in recent years, so this could be a step in the right direction for them. And 
definitely a step in the right direction for people who are looking to consume less meat, dairy and animal products for any reason, or people who just love to try new chocolate like I do. <laughs> so we're expecting to see these in stores from November, so winter time. You'll start to see them popping into shops. Bit of a strange time if you ask me to release a non kind of festive range, but it will be interesting to see how this fares and how it tastes. You're listening to the Sweet Nothings podcast. If you want more recipes, food reviews, and knowledge on all things edible, you can find it at maverickbaking.com and at Maverick Baking on YouTube. Now that we've got all of this month's juicy tidbits out of the way, let's kind of have a chat about the main crux of today's episode. So if you did miss last month's episode, I would encourage you to go and listen to it if you're in a good headspace to go and do that. If not, to briefly summarise, I developed a pretty major phobia-based eating disorder as a child. It circulated around an intense kind of phobia of vomiting from a very young age due to a whole host of reasons and it led to a whole host of problems as it inevitably would and I did come out of that before I hit the most kind of problematic time of anyone's life in my teenage years I managed to kind of step out and step into normality from my childhood issues I would say around the age of 11 you can see kind of through school pictures and things like that where the progress came back as I moved towards leaving primary school as an 11 or 12 year old and I would say from what I want to talk about today which is my teenage years and into adulthood which is when most young women and young men do face eating disorders and face body image and you know dietary issues and I certainly wasn't exempt even as someone who had been through all of this nonsense if you will <laughs> before it all kind of came back when I was probably around the age of 16 I would say I managed to get through the kind of years of the early years of puberty without too much damage of course, it comes with its own host of problems. The ages between 12 and 16, you go through puberty, whether that means starting your period, developing a more womanly figure, etc., etc., and all of the mental stuff that comes alongside that. But it wasn't until I was about 16 that my diet and my body image properly started to mean something to me. In terms of puberty and sexual progression, if you will, Kids and teenagers hit that at different ages. Girls often go through it sooner, but around the age of 16, everyone starts to kind of catch up with each other. Everyone starts looking more like adults. You start talking about doing adult things, if you will, which means that, you know, people will talk about what they find attractive or what they find unattractive, what they find sexy, what they don't find sexy, what they notice about their new bodies that aren't these skinny childlike bodies anymore you know they have shape they're broad shouldered or they're white hipped or they're big chested or they're flat chested and I think this is the time when a lot of girls and boys notice their weight as a factor because people begin to discuss it people begin to understand how what they eat translates to how they look which you just don't really think of much as a child for the most part not only that but around the age of 16 was being a baby born in 1995 was around the time when media was beginning to explode. You know, we were all starting to have we were all starting to have our own smartphones and we all had more access to the internet and all of the things that come with the internet. Social media was becoming, you know, a household name rather than just something that dingy indoor teenagers like to dabble in. And that exposes you not only to the bodies of yourself, your peers, your family members, but to women and girls all over the world. She's so much taller than me. She's so much shorter than me. She's so much skinnier. She's so much bigger. And all of this stuff that, you know, you're just bombarded with when you start dabbling independently in the internet and in the media. And I think my generation grew up in a time that was so unfiltered from everything. Mental health was not a discussion when I was at school. 
safety on the internet was very rarely a discussion when I was at school. Um, and we were exposed to a lot of things that we probably shouldn't have been <laughs> at that age, which doesn't help. And as I touched upon in last month's episode, my body had been quite stunted in height due to my issues as a child. Going by genetics, both my parents are around the height, five foot eight, five foot nine. I, for all intents and purposes, should be the same height or a very similar height. Um, going by the bloodline beyond my parents, I've all of my grandparents were taller than me, <laughs> even as I reached you know my full height. Um, I only stand at five foot two now. So that was already something I noticed. I was one of the shorter girls and that immediately makes any weight gain that you might have more noticeable and more open to people that might comment on it. You know, that your your legs look different or your tummy looks bigger or you've grown boobs all of a sudden. And all of this stuff really resonates and sits with you at that age. Similarly, I think it's around the kind of age when you begin to listen to discussions of calorie counting and of diets and things like that. You start to notice that your parents' calorie count or your friends' parents are on Weight Watchers or Slimming World or Scottish Slimmers and you start to think, oh, even just out of an innocent curiosity, you know, I wonder what I eat in a day. I wonder if I eat enough. I wonder if I eat too much. Do I eat too much sugar? Do I eat too little sugar? And this is what really kind of hit me around that age, this combination of things. And I started to experiment, as I think a lot of people do with their diets at that age. And I, I, and I began sinking into bad habits I'd had as a child and the sneakiness that my eating disorder as a child had caused me. And as I kind of prefaced the last episode with, if topics like this are a bit difficult for you to listen to, I'll kind of, you know, maybe recommend this may be the time to stop listening. Or if you do want to challenge yourself, which is important in recovery from eating disorders or anything like that, I would encourage you to try your best to listen to and see if you can relate to what is coming as well. This isn't intended to shock, to harm, to upset. It's just to share some very real life experience with everyone. But something I began to discover around this age was the kind of superiority that you can feel from the physical feeling of hunger. Now, this is incredibly awful to have to talk about. You know, there are so many people on the planet and even in this country who go to work hungry, who go to bed hungry, who go to school hungry because of means they cannot control. But because of the state I was in mentally, the media I was consuming or just exposed to, the discussions I was exposed to, the comparisons I made against my own body, I would almost enjoy the physical pain of hunger. And as a teenager, you might remember that hunger is a very real part of it. You're growing, you need more food than the average person does, your metabolism is sky high for the most part, and you feel hunger a lot. And I would often almost use that as this kind of feeling that I was doing well, this kind of, you know, reward for starving myself to at least a publicly acceptable extent. Thankfully, I never got too extreme as a teenager, but I would go six, seven, eight hours without food and that kind of sensation of emptiness was something I saw as me being better, me being successful, me doing well. These pangs of hunger, rather than being something I should pay attention to, that my body needs energy and food to keep going through a busy school day that would then often be followed by work the same day or at the weekend, I treated it as this kind of badge of honour that all I was having for the most part of the morning, the afternoon, sometimes the whole day was water and a couple of pieces of chewing gum. Do excuse me, my cat has decided to add to the conversation. 
and it's it's something that I know a lot of people will also have gone through or or feel currently as adults or when they were younger because it is this sensation that you're doing it right, that you're not overfeeding yourself or overeating or eating junk food. This hunger and emptiness, this must be what you know models feel, what the pretty girls must feel, what the girls who look great in bikinis or ballet outfits and everything must feel, that you think this is part of what it means to be not only successful, and attractive, but almost what you feel should be a sensation of being an adult woman in control of things. The word control is one we'll be revisiting a lot today. And it's horrifying to look back and think about, but it's truly something I can remember so vividly, is how much pain you would be in from hunger at that age, and just how much you almost enjoyed it. But of course, the sneakiness that comes with eating disorders means that when you're kind of used to it and better at it, as I was with years of experience, you don't publicly show it. You don't let people see the hunger. You eat at the appropriate times and you eat the appropriate amount at said appropriate times. You make sure you're eating most foods so that people can see that there's nothing wrong with you, so that they won't be suspicious, so that you can either maintain that weight or lose that weight that you want to lose without anyone even raising an eyebrow or thinking anything's wrong, which is so, pardon my French, fucked up. But that's, that's how you think. Your brain just forces you to be these two different people. On the inside, you're plotting, planning your next meal, planning the exercise you're going to need to do to burn off that next meal. On the face of it, you're excited to be here. You're excited to taste a bit of cake that you're only going to have the tiniest slice of and quietly bin the rest. Or you'll say that you ate everything you packed at school for food, but you don't. You'll say that you ate that little chocolate bar that you packed for school, that you didn't. One of the most vivid ones I have is that for several years in a row, we have a tradition here in the UK where we have advent calendars. There'll be 24 little chocolates behind little doors. And for every day leading up to Christmas from the 1st of December, you open the the little door, you take out the little chocolate, which is, I'm talking, 5 to 10 grams of chocolate for the most part. Minuscule. It's nothing but a tiny sugar hit to treat yourself in December. I couldn't even physically bring myself to eat those for the fear of what it would do for my control. So while my family would see, and they know this, if if you're listening, we have spoken about this before, but I I still hate bringing this up because it seems so, (laughs) it seems like such shitty behaviour. But I would open each little individual door each day as I was supposed to, And I would pretend I was eating these chocolates when, in actuality, I was either slipping them directly into the bin or slipping them into a tiny piece of kitchen towel, kitchen roll, and then putting them in the bin. And I am realistically talking about less than 30 calories worth of chocolate. That is how tiny these things are. And I couldn't even physically bring myself to have that little bit of joy or even that little bit of normality, if you will, because everything was about the control, the success, and keeping everything in line, no matter what time of year or festivity it was. And the discussion of calories is where things really, really got difficult for me, and it's the reason that even to this day I refuse to have, you know, scales in my home to know what I weigh because I I truly believe that for most people, numbers relative to food is so damaging, even for people who are lucky enough and comfortable enough to have a good relationship with food. Once you get into treating your food as statistics and data rather than nutrition and fuel, your brain just becomes poison around it. And this is something I really found. And it's no one's fault but my own, because I knew fine well with my history of control, obsession, of everything, of order, 
and of being a generally organised person who was a nerd with schoolwork, so I was always going to be a nerd with calorie counting, that I would get sucked into this, as so many people do. My parents were going through a kind of weight loss journey around the time I kind of ended my time at school. And I hadn't lost a significant amount of weight at this point. I was just maintaining a very low weight, just the acceptable amount for someone of my height in terms of the recognised BMI scale. And my parents kind of decided in January of one year that they wanted to lose a bit of weight. It was that usual time after Christmas when everyone, you know, looks to their waistlines and to their wallets and thinks, right, sod this, we need to shed some of this, get back to normal so that things are in order for spring and summer when I'm wearing more revealing clothing again. Everyone does it. It's a natural state of the human condition. <laughs> and my parents actually had a very, very successful go of it this year. We decided that calorie counting was a good method for them. We kind of treated it as like a team effort where I was helping them because I was the person who cooked everything in the house just by both my enjoyment of it and my control with it. And it meant that they were able to kind of chat about their day, their progress at the dinner table, and we could all kind of engage in it together. And it was encouraging, it really helped, and they did so well. They lost the weight that they wanted to, they were healthier, they were fitter, and they are still fitter, happier, healthier people for it. However, <laughs> I had to go and, of course, make this as dramatic as possible. So in learning to cook and to bake as I did, I was enjoying the process and I still very much enjoy the process. Obviously, I wouldn't be speaking to you if that weren't the case, but it also kind of taught me the ways in which people cut calories or cut fat or cut carbs from their diet while doing this. And instead of just taking a normal approach to it and eating a normal amount of food... I began to learn calories and how they worked from apps like MyFitnessPal that my parents were using, which were fantastic and are fantastic for certain purposes, but are also so, so, so dangerous, destructive, damaging, downright wrong for people who don't need to lose weight for medical purposes. I began to learn by heart and could still recite to you by heart the calories that are in just about every single component of the average Western diet, from fruit and vegetables, to carbohydrates, to different cooking fats, to meats, everything. Branded snacks, condiments, dressings, everything. Recorded like a library in my brain, so that every time I ate something, if I wasn't physically weighing it for myself, whether in or out of the view of family members and friends, but I knew to the decimal point what my body was consuming and that is absolutely absurd <laughs> and I don't say this to poke fun at anyone who is still suffering because I know exactly how it feels like just the end of the world if you were to have five grams more or 20 calories more than you were planning to it feels like your entire life is spiraling out of control in the same way that OCD sufferers feel if you know, their their forms of order are broken or out of time or out of place. You can't describe how it feels. It's not just this fear of weight gain or of bodily changes. The control you have over these these details, these statistics, these numbers makes you feel like your entire life, your entire self-worth is dependent on what the screen says. What you've done, what you've eaten, what you've burned, everything. Whether you enjoyed it, irrelevant. Whether it was cheap or expensive, irrelevant. Whether it allowed you a lovely time to bond with family over the dinner table after a hard day enjoying good food, irrelevant. It was all data that needed to be properly organised, properly calculated and properly in line with expectations. That's all food was. It eventually reached a point where I realised I wasn't well. And that this was a relatively novel form 
of disordered eating. You know, in the 90s, we didn't have such detailed, instant and accurate knowledge of calorie counting. People still had diets and weight loss schemes, but you couldn't just tap onto my fitness pal and calculate to the T what you'd eaten for the week. You just didn't and you wouldn't, it was impossible. But I saw my weight dropping and while I loved it on the inside, and while I adored waking up first thing in the morning and seeing how flat my stomach was, this achievement, everything I thought I'd done for myself and somehow placing more value in that than the fact I was a well-rounded member of society on her way to a very prestigious degree at a prestigious university, you know, with a loving family and at the time a loving boyfriend too, what was more important to me was that image. Not even in its entirety. Because as you can see, I take very little care <laughs> in doing my hair, in picking the best clothes and wearing spotless makeup. But that outward appearance of control, of discipline, of success, that often is associated with thinness, is what I had. And I loved it. But... I was still hungry. I was still feeling those hunger pangs. I wasn't satisfied. I could physically feel when my blood sugar was too high or low. I would be shaking some days because there hadn't been enough food in my body for what I needed. The numbers on the screen told me I'd had enough. The numbers on the screen said that X amount of calories was enough for breakfast, so that's all I would eat. When in reality, my blood sugar had dropped so low, my hands would be shaking to almost that of an addict's level of, you know, discomfort and desperation for food and for nourishment of some kind, but I wouldn't indulge in it because the numbers, the numbers said I was fine, so I must be, which is, again, utterly ludicrous. <laughs> and thankfully, despite what I went through as a child, leaving physical and mental scars. It also allowed me a much faster recovery from this first stage of teenage disordered eating due to the fact I realised what I was doing was wrong. Though it felt absolutely fine and it looked fine, I remained a relatively healthy weight, again just on the tipping point of being below the kind of acceptable healthy weight for my BMI just so that people wouldn't be suspicious of anything like they were when I was a kid. It got to a point when I realised I wasn't happy. I got to a point when I realised I wasn't well. I would have put the spoon of my cereal back into its bowl and had already entered the weight of the cereal, the milk and even the splash of milk I'd had in my tea with breakfast that morning and I realised that this wasn't right. My boyfriend at the time had seen me doing it and questioned what I was doing and why I was doing it so obsessively. And I began to kind of, in my head, try and unravel the whole thing like a big tangle of a ball of wool. Just that this wasn't right, it wasn't healthy, that it wasn't sustainable. And I began a very, very problematic path to recovery. <laughs> By problematic, I don't mean that it was a kind of unacceptable form of recovery, because recovery from anything, whether it's disordered eating, whether it's an addiction, problems of any kind, I just picked, I picked the wrong kind of problematic to go with. <laughs> While my eating issue had been entirely body image based in terms of the control, the thinness, the discipline, the route I took to success, to recovery, was through what is now categorised among medical professionals as what is called orthorexia. Now, I touched on this briefly in last month's episode. Orthorexia is essentially an unhealthy obsession with nutritious food. Now, as you're probably thinking to yourself, as you will continue to do, <laughs> you might think, oh, what's wrong with that? 
what, why, why is that unhealthy? Why is that a disorder? That in itself is what makes orthorexia so damn dangerous because it is impossible to spot unless you're really, really paying attention to someone. The orthorexia, I would say, was an issue for me around the time when wellness food bloggers were at their peak. Think Hensley and Hemsley, think Deliciously Ella, and the kind of wave of veganism, gluten-free, plant-based food that happened around the mid to late 2010s, if you will. This period was rocky for me in a really bad way. While I had kind of begun to realise my issues with calorie counting and I deleted and reinstalled my fitness pal countless times, easily over 25 times, I would have a moment where I would say, right, that's it, I'm going cold turkey, I'm deleting this app, I'm never counting calories again. And then in a three days time, I would download it again because I just needed to see what this new food stuff contained or I needed to know if I'd gone over or under today. And I eventually managed to break out of this. And part of what I'd done to break myself out of it was to throw myself more into cooking. Maverick Baking had been up and running since about 2015. And I was already into baking. I loved baking programs. Sweet foods were something I always enjoyed, even in the depths of my issues as a kid and as a teenager and as an adult. Sweet foods have always been my favourite thing to eat and something that have really helped keep me kind of grounded and balanced. But I got more into cooking as I kind of dived into this orthorexia issue and I became unhealthily obsessed with all things nutrition. For absolutely no reason, because, you know, thankfully no one in my family was ill or had any issues to recover from that required the strict nutritious diets that some of the wellness bloggers and wellness influencers were peddling at the time, I dived head first into this. This was around the time everyone was adding chia seeds to everything. I was buying bee pollen. I was buying f milled flaxseed. I was buying steel cut oats instead of regular Scottish oats, which are cheap and accessible everywhere anyway. I was buying spirulina powder. I was buying just, I was buying raw cacao because apparently it had more health benefits than dark chocolate, which I'm pretty sure is still unproven. I was buying cacao nibs instead of eating chocolate because it was supposed to give you a healthy hit. And the bizarre thing about orthorexia is that it's so opposite to calorie counting that I actually have no idea how I can fit those jigsaw pieces of my life together. Orthorexia, in essence, could mean that you are so fearful, fearful, not just kind of, you know, discouraging or disgusted by, but utterly shaken, fearful of unhealthy, un non-nutritious foods that you would literally rather eat double the calories of a healthy thing than you would of the unhealthy thing. It makes no logical sense whatsoever. To put that into perspective, if you were to hand me two options of food at the time, even as someone who had been a recklessly accurate calorie counter, if you were to place in front of me a 90 calorie slice of white bread with 90 calories of Nutella on top, or a 130 calorie slice of seeded wholemeal organic brown bread topped with you know, some kind of higher nut content, raw cacao, hazelnut spread that added a further 150 calories to the slice of toast, making it, you know, a fairly substantial snack, I would take the second option without hesitation. Even if it tasted worse, and even if it had more calories, which went against the very logic my brain had worked with <laughs> just months previously, I would take option number two with the higher calories, just because of this promise of nutrition. And I'll be the first to admit, obviously, as a girl in her early 20s, late teens, early 20s, of course I didn't notice any fecking difference when I was eating these higher nutrient foods because I was already relatively balanced and healthy in my diet anyway. It was such a waste of time, money, and mental gymnastics 
It's ridiculous. <laughs> I couldn't comprehend at the time the idea of just eating a bowl of porridge that my Scottish ancestors have been eating for literal centuries that would be made with just water or just milk or whatever. I would have to add chia seeds, flax seeds, um, organic runny peanut butter that didn't have any palm oil or any sugar added that I would then top with, you know, special toasted coconut flakes and cacao nibs and two kinds of fruit and all of this other stuff that of course came with ridiculous digestive issues and a ridiculous price tag. I would add protein powder to, you know, there's just the smallest amount of coffee. I couldn't drink a coffee without adding, you know, a special kind of milk or protein powder or something. My lunchbox always had to have so many different components so that I was eating at least four or five portions of fruit and vegetables in one sitting. And for what? <laughs> for what does my question? You'll probably know yourself, dear listener, if you've ever had issues like this. Whether you eat five vegetables in a day or 15 vegetables in a day, you will not notice very much difference apart from perhaps a faster time between eating it and going to the toilet from it. It's really not a huge difference. As long as your diet contains a couple of fruits and vegetables and a decent balance of fat, protein and carbohydrates relative to your height, weight, lifestyle, preference, joy, whatever, you're, you're fine. You're grand. You will feel great most days. It was utterly, utterly unhinged of me, if you don't mind me using a slightly, you know, non-politically correct language towards myself here. It made no sense. I wasn't even someone who loved exercise. This was the funniest part. You know, often you the people who you would see sharing the super high nutrition vegan stuff and the wellness foods deliciously, Ella, Hemsley and Hemsley, etc. These were super, super fit women. They would go to the gym four or five times a week or they would do yoga. They would do the intense, hot, sweaty, crazy traditional Indian yoga. And I was doing none of this. The most exercise I did was I would walk on a treadmill or, you know, go on and, and one of the stepper machine things or I would just go out for a walk because I hate exercise. I hate it. Unless it's a walk somewhere with a friend or with a good podcast like this one or with some music, I hate exercise. I hate sports. I always have. So this diet made absolutely no sense. But again, it was all, all about control. Even if it was less about my body image and about the flat stomach that I coveted and, you know, loved having until I realised I was mentally unhappy. It was all about making sure I ticked off the right amount of water consumed in a day, that I ticked off the correct amount of portions of fruit and vegetables in a day, that I ticked off my macronutrients, that I'd had enough protein, enough carbohydrates and enough fat that was made up for me by an app on a phone that I kept deleting and re-downloading rather than just how I felt. By the time I was coming towards the end of uni, I was beginning to really recognise how much this had started to consume my life. The orthorexia side really kind of tainted the baking side of me for a little while because I was obsessed with putting flaxseed or wholemeal flour into whichever cakes or cookies or flapjacks I was making instead of just making them properly delicious and people began to notice it you know my family obviously weren't as accepting of a plant-based coconut butter flapjack than they were of just a good old-fashioned slab of chocolate brownie that I would also previously have made people noticed and I noticed because when you then had a proper slab of chocolate brownie it tasted like cherubs singing in your mouth <laughs> compared to the blandness of the plant-based wellness food that had been sold to me like a fool but at the end of uni when the stress of studying for my law degree began to kind of dwindle and come to an end, the stress of the hires at school, the stress of finding, you know, a boyfriend who loved me, the stress of generally being a person under the age of 20, which had all culminated in my obsession with being able to control the things in my life via food, via my appearance, 
when I couldn't control other things, the discipline, how it made me look outwardly successful, all of this as I kind of rocketed towards adulthood finally began to calm down from all of the various formats that I'd hurled myself through, through phobias, through fears, through hyper-discipline, through body image, through obsessive nutrition, all of the, every format of eating disorder you can find in a book. I've probably been there for at least two months. (laughs) And eventually, I was blessed enough to come across people on social media, which is so vilified, that really did save not only my mental health, but save my life ultimately. As much as social media gives you access to models, to influencers, to naturally skinny people, or naturally, you know, hyper fit people, It also gives you access to people who can teach you so much about the basic concept of not only loving yourself, but just accepting yourself. And I don't mean that in a kind of settling way. I mean that in just, in terms of you are so much more than the the meat shell with which you (laughs) walk around the world in. And I learned about intuitive eating, which has since been an absolute saviour for me, even if it means pushing against norms, questioning norms, questioning habits and changing things, it's what has ultimately led me to be so happy, content and balanced in what I'm able to eat and live around today. And for that, before we round off today, I just want to share four different things which have really, really helped me become stable and in a position that I would now happily call recovered from my issues. Even if my issues or your issues or your friend or family member's issues are always present in their brain, I think the whole definition of being recovered means not only being able to recognise these issues if and when they do arise again, but being able to be more powerful than them, be more reasonable than them, be more intelligent than them. And here are four kind of little tips that have helped me and might help you or someone you know if you are currently or have gone through any of the <laughs> the nonsense I've taken you through today. And the main one, as I've touched upon, is intuitive eating, which is learning to truly listen to your hunger cues and that can involve a lot of fighting your own brain to listen to your body. Don't just eat at the times you normally eat just because it's food time. It can teach you to value food at certain times of day and resent it at others or it can force you to eat food when you're not hungry that spoils your attitude and makes you feel worse both in and about your body. If you don't like the feeling of being full and being bloated, don't eat three big meals a day, as is the norm. Eat five or six smaller ones, or have small meals and plenty regular snacks, as I do. If there's a sensation you don't like, if you hate the feeling of hunger, make sure you eat regularly. Don't leave big gaps and do the whole fill yourself then starve yourself routine. Keep your blood sugar up if that makes you feel better. Obviously, based on your lifestyle, eat around when works for you. Don't just eat because it's a time when other people eat. And don't be afraid to eat outside of times that are normal. Whether you like to eat certain foods super early in the morning or if you get really hungry late at night but not during the day, don't fear eating or don't not eat just because others aren't. And it's hard as a social creature, as human beings are, to do that. But it's really, really important to learn to understand your body as much as you can and as gently as you can, even if it takes months or years to understand what your body wants and what it's happy with. But it's been one of the biggest steps for me. A second one definitely alluding to that is to treat your body with the care with which it treats you. 
your body gets you up out of bed every morning. If you're fortunate enough, it helps you walk, it helps you stretch, reach for things, run, jump, bend, everything. It allows you the joys of laughter, of happy crying, of orgasms, of, you know, seeing family members happy and feeling happy for them, of joy, of fear. It's got all of these different things it serves you with. Treat it with what it deserves. Don't punish it. Don't cause it pain. Don't cause it stress. Don't push it to the limits like people will try and tell you to when you're trying to lose weight or be healthier. You know, treat it with the respect with which it treats you. Third point I would say is that there is a huge, huge benefit from learning to cook or learning to bake. Learning to feed yourself and understand the science and the culture around food was a big, big factor for me. Not only eating, what again, what everyone else eats, learn to cook the stuff you really love eating and learn to enjoy eating the stuff you really love eating whenever you want to eat it. Learn the science behind food. Learn why you need this much fat with this much protein in order for a recipe to work. Learn why you need um, a high carb version of something to pair with something else. Learn how food reacts to heat, to time, to spices, to different seasonings, etc. Don't don't fear what goes into things. Learn if they need to be used, why they need to be used, and why the human palate enjoys them. And you'll have such a better understanding and appreciation of cooking, of preparing food, and of eating, and nourishing yourself with whatever it is you've made, rather than reducing food to data and statistics. And finally, I would always encourage you to be a bit of a, a bit of a rebel when it comes to anything to do with diet culture. Now, by diet culture, I don't just mean the 1990s, Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, Slimming World, Scottish Slimmers, whatever it's called, but I also mean from keto, from low carb, from intermittent fasting, from whatever trendy thing that people are doing to try and lose weight through some exciting new format. They're all diets. No matter what they call themselves, no matter how much they'll tell you it's a lifestyle, not a diet or a temporary thing, it's a diet. And the more you can distance yourself from or question or even debate these things with yourself and with others, the freer you will feel. Ask yourself why that person's intermittent fasting. Is it because they understand the pros and cons (laughs) of leaving gaps between one meal and the next? Of course they don't. They've read a couple of pages on Google or they've read something from someone on social media or maybe, maybe they've read a book, but they aren't scientists, they aren't nutritionists, they aren't registered dietitians. They're just someone who's trying to lose weight through a new fancy version of calorie counting. (laughs) The more you can distance yourself from it, the more you can question it or just let it wash over you, the better. Because what's good for someone else isn't necessarily good for you. And that, folks, is, I think, probably an up-to-date summary of (laughs) the intricacies of my mental issues from cradle to now (laughs) and what I hope you can take away as help for yourself or for a loved one if you or they have been through something similar or are going through something similar. Eating disorders are incredibly complex things. They're so underdiagnosed, they're so misunderstood, and they can be so variable from person to person, from male to female, from young to old, for whatever reason they happen, or for how long they happen. They're such bizarre things, and it takes so much self-reflection, so much analysis, and so much learning to get over that it would be impossible to summarise useful tips for everyone here. And as I said, I'm no expert. I'm I'm a lawyer, but I am no medical professional. <laughs> I certainly didn't have the patience for even more years of study. So all I would all I would encourage you to do is to self-reflect, to take responsibility for what it is that you want 
what you think you need to do. If you think you're being unhealthy physically, unhealthy mentally, take the time to properly look at what your body needs, what your mind needs. And if anything I've shared with you today has helped, I'm really, I'm really glad and I'm really grateful. I also wanted to thank you all for such a lovely, lovely response to the previous episode. I wasn't sure, and I never am sure, how bearing of the soul goes down with people. You know, I hoped it wasn't too kind of narcissistic and rambly, much like this. <laughs> and I'm glad that some people have been able to find value in it. And I hope this episode will be similar. And of course, I want to thank you all for listening, as always, to any episode of the podcast, especially these ones, and for taking the time to, you know, try and understand the background and the issues that people with mental problems that are less spoken about and less glamorous than the usual ones you hear about. I really appreciate it. And of course, this is about all I have for today. Thank you so much for listening or for watching whichever medium or format you are listening through. I really hope you've enjoyed this month's episode and I look forward to speaking to you next month. You're listening to the Sweet Nothings podcast. If you want to support the production, get access to exclusive foodie content and early access to podcast episodes, you can do so via Patreon. Just search for Sweet Nothings or Maverick Baking on Patreon and thank you for everything.